Your experience is currency. Your memories and interests reduced to data, which is then sold to companies for the purpose of selling you more. Advertising. It's inescapable and is always there to remind you how little you have and how unhappy you really are. Not to worry though, for a better life, it's just one purchase away. Hello and welcome to Animation Propaganda. Last time, we looked at contraband cartoons and how popular characters have been appropriated to spread propaganda. Today's topic is seemingly more wholesome, but potentially equally as insidious. Advertising, or how cartoons have been used to sell products. We're going to be looking at some famous ad campaigns featuring established and original characters, as well as the effectiveness of television in spreading propaganda. But first, let's see how modern advertising came to be. Advertising as we know it grew out of America's propaganda efforts during the First World War. Now we talked about this a bit in Episode 1. American support for joining the war was low, so the government assembled the Committee on Public Information. The purpose of the CPI was to demonize the Germans and convince the American public that their involvement in combat was just. They did so by spreading atrocity stories, portraying the Germans as brutish monsters, hell-bent on destroying your family and everything you love. They also promoted patriotism, and depending on your definition, their efforts were successful. Edward Bernays was the director of the CPI's Latin News Service. He was also the nephew of Sigmund Freud. Bernays has been called the father of public relations, and we will be addressing one of his most popular campaigns, The Tortures of Freedom, a little more thoroughly in an upcoming episode. But to quickly summarize, Bernays was hired by Big Tobacco to change the public opinion on women's smoking. He did so by presenting it as liberating and a symbol of female independence. Bernays used his uncle's theories to tap into the unconscious desires of consumers. Rather than present facts, he purported that bacon and eggs were the all-American breakfast, you know, the patriotic way to start your day. Bernays' other campaigns convinced people that disposable Dixie cups were more convenient and sanitary than reusable glasses, and that water fluoridation was safe for treating public water. Prior to this, advertising was in a way far more honest. This is the product. This is what it does. After Bernays, advertising became more about selling an idea or a feeling rather than a product. The golden age of American animation gave way to the television era. TV was an exciting new medium that could bring images of the world directly into your living room. Beginning in the late 1950s, theatrical shorts from the 30s and 40s were repackaged into television blocks and aired on Saturday mornings. Television had created the demand for more content, airtime wasn't cheap, and that money had to come from somewhere. Ready-to-eat breakfast cereal had been a staple of American diets since the 19th century, but following World War II, companies began adding sugar and aggressively targeting children. Given their time slot, cartoons and sugar cereal were seemingly a match made in heaven. Cartoon characters hawking products was nothing new, though. After all, in 1939, Mickey Mouse used his film at the World's Fair to show Nabisco cookies, but now, the stars of the show you were watching would take a quick break to promote the food you could or would be eating. Out of all the studios, Hanna-Barbera was probably the most influential in bringing original animated programming to Saturday morning. They also had a massive marketing presence. Clearly, it was a different time, as they advertised both of the major brands, Kellogg's and Post's. Everyone did. The idea of corporate licensing was still novel. Saturday Morning also introduced several characters that have since become stars in their own right. 1952 gave us Tony the Tiger, spokesman for Frosted Flakes. He was designed by a group of former Disney animators that included Art Babbitt, who kicked off the Disney strike, and was voiced by Dallas McKennon, and then Thurl Ravenscroft, who is probably most associated with the role. Eventually, he assumed an Italian-American identity. This was at a time when Italian-Americans were still not fully assimilated into American culture, and Tony became something of a role model for youth within that community. The group behind Tony also animated that period's Snap, Crackle, and Pop, the mascots for Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Now, this trio debuted in the 1930s. Uh, they first appeared in cartoon form in the 1939 short Breakfast Pals. They are elves, named after the sounds the cereal makes when milk is added. Many iconic voice actors have portrayed the characters over the years. You had Doss Butler, Don Messick, and Frank Welker, just to name a few. Another fun fact, before their stint on Saturday morning, the trio was featured in Homefront Propaganda during World War II. Rounding out the major Kellogg's characters is Toucan Sam. He was voiced by Mel Blanc and Shield Fruit Loops, starting in 1963, still does today. Over at Post, you had Sugar Bear, spokes bear for Sugar Crisp, now known as Golden Crisp, as sugar is a bad word. Originally, the cereal was represented by three bears, Candy, Handy, and Dandy, but they are amalgamated into one Sugar Bear. In commercials he crooned, he just couldn't get enough of that Sugar Crisp. He also starred in the cartoon Linus the Lionhearted, alongside other post mascots, but this was cancelled when the FCC ruled it illegal for cartoon characters to appear in commercials during their own show. In the late 19th century, a revolutionary new means of food service was introduced in Berlin, Germany. The Automat was a large vending machine that allowed consumers the purchase of pre-made meals and alcohol. In 1902, Quisisana, the company behind the first automat, set up shop in Philadelphia. Fast food had come to America. 
Two decades later, a restaurant opened that would marry fast food to the hamburger, at least in the US, White Castle. White Castle, more or less created the template for all that came after it, is credited with popularizing the hamburger and paved the way for the granddaddy of all fast food chains, McDonald's. McDonald's has grown from a food stand owned by brothers Maurice and Richard McDonald into a global conglomerate responsible for feeding 69 million people a day. Now, McDonald's has used animation in many other ad campaigns over the years. Uh, this makes sense, as they heavily target children through the Happy Meal. Their mascot, Ronald McDonald, a clown, is also easily one of the most recognizable characters on the planet. The 1970s gave us McDonald Land, a fantastic world featuring McDonald's properties. Uh, we cover this in an old media loss, but these were originally produced in live action. Uh, they actually resembled the work of Sid and Marty Croft so much, it ended in litigation. But in the late 1990s, McDonald Land got animated with the wacky adventures of Ronald McDonald. With animation by Klasky Chupo, the studio behind Rugrats and the early seasons of The Simpsons, these were a series of straight-to-video releases that were sold in store. Most featured generic plots, though some fan service was paid. In one episode, they travel back to the 70s and meet Mayor McCheese, a character that was retired in 1985. McDonald's largest competitor, Burger King, tried their hand at competing with the Burger King Kids Club. This faction debuted in 1989 and featured a diverse cast of characters led by Kid Vid. This is 90s success personified, it's very in your face, extreme, but looking at the inclusiveness of this group in 2020 is really something. Sure, they could have had more of a female presence, but the inclusion of a paraplegic character is notable. Uh, probably should have come up with a better name than Wheels though, you know, just my opinion. Because of their market dominance, McDonald's and Burger King have also attracted major corporate tie-ins for their Happy Meal or Kids Meals respectively. Throughout the 1990s, every Disney release would seemingly receive a tie-in, but on the other side of the fast food coin, we have pizza. Nowadays, with courier services, you can get any food delivered right to your door, but for many years, Chinese and pizza were really your only options, at least in America. Pizza delivery was popularized here by Domino's, who incorporated the 30-minute or free policy, meaning your pizza would be free, if not delivered in time. In 1986, they introduced the Noid, an animated supervillain that embodied the struggles of delivering a pizza on time. The Noid was designed by Will Vinton Studios and rendered in claymation. Uh, everything was blamed on the Noid. You know, late delivery, it was the Noid. Toppings wrong, the Noid. <laughs> However, the campaign was abandoned after Kenneth Lamar Noid, a paranoid schizophrenic, held two Domino's employees at gunpoint, believing the commercials to be taunting him. Now, this story is wild. At one point, he forced them to cook him a pizza, and while he ate it, they escaped. Uh, he eventually was found not guilty by reason of insanity and took his own life in 1995. From Barbie to Hot Wheels, toy manufacturer Mattel have left an indelible mark on childhoods everywhere. In 1982, they released a series of action figures known as Masters of the Universe. The toy line revolved around protagonist He-Man and his nemesis Skeletor. The Masters of the Universe aesthetic incorporated aspects of both fantasy and sci-fi, and its canon was first informed by mini-comics on the toy's packaging. The following year, they debuted a television series based on the franchise titled He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. This was produced by Filmation, and every episode was essentially a half-hour commercial for the toys. At the same time, Mattel's chief competitor, Hasbro, launched a similar series for their military-themed doll, G.I. Joe. Joe's roots go back to the 1960s. It was the original action figure and was promoted as America's movable fighting man. The marketing for G.I. Joe sought to introduce boys to the doll market, as the term doll was gendered towards female toys. Joe was highly influential, and in the early 90s it made a comeback. A partnership between Marvel and Hasbro gave us G.I. Joe, a real American hero, a new toy line, and accompanying television series. Now, the marketing potential for this was huge, and not only gave Hasbro and Mattel a platform to promote their existing products, but also the opportunity to introduce new characters to coincide with the toys launching. This was when television was a little less regulated, and you could still get away with targeting children through some deceptive practices. The popularity of these shows and the effectiveness of their marketing campaigns eventually caused parents and interest groups to take notice, though. Both series found an enemy in ACT, or Action for Children's Television. ACT believed broadcasters had an obligation to air children's programming that would benefit them educationally, and that shows like He-Man and G.I. Joe served no other purpose than to sell children products. While it would not be officially mandated until the passing of the Children's Television Act in 1990, these shows responded to criticism by tacking PSAs on the end of every episode. He-Man would relate its life lesson to the previous episode. Characters told us that escaping into drugs doesn't make our problems go away, it just creates new ones, and that with great power comes great responsibility. G.I. Joe marketed its lessons a bit better. Theirs were endorsed by the National Child Safety Council and were more reality-based. This included staying off thin ice, not judging others, and staying out of strangers' cars. All great messages, in case you didn't know, now you know, and knowing is half the battle. 
Simpson's creator Matt Groening rose to fame as an alternative cartoonist, and when, given the chance, he did what any respecting artist would. He sold out. The success of The Simpsons not only allowed them to promote a plethora of their own original merchandise, but they lent their images to other products and services as well. The most famous probably being Butterfinger, the crispity, crunchity, peanut buttery candy bar. Butterfinger dates back to 1923 in Chicago's Curtis Candy Company. It was promoted in the 1934 Shirley Temple film, Baby Take a Bow. The partnership between Butterfinger and The Simpsons began prior to the show officially airing in 1988, when they were still featured only on The Tracy Ullman Show. In addition to the standard chocolate bar, The Simpsons marketed various offshoots, including frozen treats and Butterfinger BBs, small snack-sized portions, but also themselves. It's clear great care was put into these early commercials. Voice actors reprised their roles, and they more resemble animated shorts, with narratives and gags included. Minor characters from the show appeared, and they were produced alongside the regular season, so the style and humor of that season is reflected in the commercials. Before Who Shot Mr. Burns, there was Who Laid a Finger on Bart's Butterfinger. This was a contest in 1993 where people would write in their predictions with the winner getting $50,000. The options were Mr. Burns, Lisa, Otto, Krusty, Nelson, and Homer. Spoiler, it was Krusty disguised as Homer for the fake out. This is definitely the peak of the ad campaign. It continued through 2013 when there was another contest, Who Stole Bart's Bar, with the later commercials simplified both in terms of humor and animation, uh, which, you know, the same could be said for the series. Television, more than any other medium, shaped the 20th century. It entertained, informed, and yes, even manipulated us into thinking or spending a certain way. Next time, we will join Walt Disney on a goodwill mission to South America and see how the United States has impacted the Latin world. Now, this was not meant to be exhaustive. This topic is huge, and I could probably build a whole season around it, and there is plenty I missed, so feel free to leave your favorite in the comments. In case you missed it, there is a free preview of our new Patreon-exclusive series, Century of Schlock, looking at animated smut from the 20th century. Patreon.com slash Portraits. See it and support us there. Be sure to like this video, subscribe if you haven't, and check out the rest of the series. You know, give the Cold War a little love. It deserves it. As always, thank you so much for your interest in this channel, and thanks for watching. Stay safe out there.